Um, Lloyd, thank you very much. And, uh, and thank you very much for inviting me to, to give a, a lecture today. It's a great honor. Um, when, uh, when you kindly invited me to, to give this lecture some time ago, I enthusiastically took up the, uh, the idea uh, with the idea of um, a very broad spanning uh, overview. Um, and as I started to prepare the lecture, I have to admit it's, it's narrowed down a little bit and um, become a little bit more focused. Um, what I plan to do during the course of the following 15 minutes is really to reconsider what I think is, uh, having worked in the Gulf and Eastern Arabia for a long time, I think one is one of the most interesting phenomena that occurs in the region, which is the, the, the broader, um, to consider the broader developments in settlement activity in Eastern Arabia between, I'm not very pedantic about the dating, the roughly 4th, 3rd BC through to 3rd, 4th AD. And I will also may say a few words about the Sasanian period taking us up to the, to the rise of Islam. But I'm really focusing on that uh, 600 year, more or less 600 year span, which doesn't really have a name doesn't really have a very good name. In, 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 the, in the Mediterranean, we tend to call it the classical or Hellenistic period. In India, they call it the, the early historic period. Um, the, I think the most convenient name in this part of the world that offends fewest people is the, probably the PIR period from the French pre-Islamic raison. Um, that's what we tend to use these days. And the chronology, that's the terminology set out by Michel Mouton. And that's the uh, there on this screen. You can see rough chronology, the chronology that Michel set out on the basis of his PhD work, based on Malaya particularly and Adur. So this is a very personal perspective. I'm not intending to give a great overview. A lot has already been written by scholars who know much more about this period than I do. Um, I want to take a slightly different perspective, a very personal perspective, and I want to consider some of the issues that this settlement boom that we're going to look at raises and, uh, and what it tells us about the region and about broader developments. I'm going to start off with a brief consideration of the Iron Age, again, quite loosely termed from about the 1300 to 300 BC, go through the PAR period, looking at some but not all of the really important sites and introducing uh, I think quite importantly, some sites that are much less well known, but I think are much more potentially have got, got a lot to say about the period. And then, as I said, I'll mention a few, say a few words about the Sasanian period, a period when things train, change quite dramatically. And we'll talk about the de definition and characteristics of this boom, add some important details and think about causes and consideration and implications. So this is, a, I think I, I'm suddenly aware being recorded and posted online about copyright issues, which I don't normally think about. This map, I think, is partly taken from Michel Mouton's book, and I've added quite a lot to it. This is a more or less complete um, map of the sites that we're going to be thinking about today. Some of them practically unknown, Umul Nemal, very uh, in, in Kuwait, and Akaz Island, a bit, little bit better known. Some of them very well known, like Phileka, Malaya, and Adur, and so forth. So um, don't worry, we're not going to go through all of them. Let's start with the Iron Age. I think there are a couple of important points to make about the Iron Age. When we look at Eastern Arabia in the Iron Age, um, we notice that there actually isn't very much going on. And um, I'm not the only one that, that's, that's uh, made this point. Dan Potts has made this point in a couple of published papers. Um, it's, a, it's an important thing to say. And I think uh, it depends on where you are in the Gulf. When you come to Kuwait, uh, do we need to explain these absences? Um, actually, when we're in Kuwait, I think we need to explain the presences because they're actually very rare. We have a Bronze Age presence and we have a, a PIR presence and an early Islamic presence. But for most of Kuwait's history, there's very little archaeology. When we get further down the Gulf, the, it's the more the absences that we need to explain rather than the presences. And that's the nature of a hyper-arid environment like this. But certainly when we look at, um, at Phylica, one of the best known sites in Kuwait, we see that there's actually really very little activity during the so-called Iron Age period, having, as I said, already had, having been a, an important location in the Bronze Age. Um, it's sometimes difficult to pin archeologists down in their publications to absences. People don't like to say, because it is very difficult to identify an absence in an archeological sequence. So sometimes it, one has to really search through and, and convince oneself. But certainly if we look at Phylica, um, the, the evidence is very thin for this period. Uh, we're at Tel Kazne, just to the north of the main Hellenistic, so-called Hellenistic area. Uh, there's a little bit, of, little stuff going on. We look at the main trench on the island. Uh, there's increased declining amount of material as time goes by, few burials, one or two figurines. But really um, rather elusive, the evidence. Um, we move down to Khalat al-Bahrain. Again, it's not, this is a site which is obviously a deep tell, and it's again difficult to, to pin down the, the, the excavators. 
But uh, when we look at the evidence, we see that the Kassite warehouse has burned down about 1400. There's a little bit of building. We know that Dillman <clears throat> was not mentioned in Mesopotamian sources between about the 13th and the uh, 8th century BC. Um, and when we look and when we go through uh, Fleming and uh, uh, Hoyland and Anderson's text, we, we reading into the literature, reading in between the lines to some degree, I think we can sort of detect a decline in, in the amount of evidence that uh, that has been is being picked up in the stratigraphic excavation. Of course, we can never be sure that there wasn't a great area of activity that shifted somewhat and is buried only a 200 or 300 meters away. And we have to be aware of that. But when we look at the accumulating evidence, I think it's increasingly clear that there's not much going on in Bahrain at this time. And Step, uh, Stefan Terp Larsen's work on the on the burial mounds uh, has also confirmed that this period is a period where there's relatively uh, little going on up until about 300 BC between, between those two dates. Dan Potts, who was he heavily involved in the Eastern Province Survey, published in Atlau, also uh, reinforces this point in his comments and in, and as I said, later, a couple of later co publications, that the real lack of material in the survey corpus in that region there. And there are a few sites. I'm not saying there's nothing, and it's, there, it's very rare that th things are absolute in archaeological data like that, but we're trying to detect, and I think it's important to try to detect nuances, periods of high activity, periods of low activity, and periods of changing levels of activity. So here's a list of a few of the sites that are known, uh, but it's really not uh, massively impre impressive when we compare it to earlier and later periods. When we move into the Oman Peninsula, things are quite different, and that's an interesting um, example of region, quite localized uh, developments. The, P, the what we, depending on whose chronology you want to take, and I don't want to get into arguments about Iron One and Iron Two and so forth. But if we take Peter McGee's uh, chronology for the Iron Age, established really in 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 the northern part in in the UAE, um, we can see that the Iron Two, particularly between about 1,100 or maybe 100, 1,000 or around about there, through to about 600 or so is a period of absolutely remarkable increased activity, a very dense level of activity, almost wherever you go. Um, what happened before it, and more, to more, greater degree, what, what ex happened, exactly happened just after it is a little bit less clear um, in terms of broad, broad, broad patterns. One uh, nicely, uh, nice piece of evidence for this is, is uh, Nasser al-Jahwari's um, PhD, uh, where he basically went through the literature and tried to make a database of every known site from Eastern Arabia. Uh, from southeast the southeast Arabia, frankly, rather, um, and th there, as well as in his own and the Rustak fieldwork and many other um, elements of fieldwork, it was very clear that the Iron Age, the Iron One period, uh, is a period that is very heavily represented in almost all areas of the archaeological record. Lots of pottery, lots of sites, lots of activity in that, and and it covers that area there. So very broadly, when we look at Eastern Arabia in, in this, in the Iron Age, loosely defined, and uh, if we accept that the Iron Three after about 600 does, does is, is a period of, of some of decline, declining activity, and that's more difficult to be sure of, then that's the sort of picture that we get. Not very much going on in Kuwait, a little bit going on in the Eastern province, and quite a lot going on in the Oman Peninsula. So that's the backdrop. That's the background. Let's move into the PAR period, uh, about 300 BC, and we see things changing very dramatically. Um, uh, Phylica, as I think is well known, and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, assuming that people are pretty, pretty well informed, but the F5, the tail uh, on Phylica, we see the construction of the fortress, uh, which has got um, various periods of occupation and abandonment eventually. Um, uh, and it's not the only site. It's uh, there. Are, there are burials. There are ins inscriptions, uh, and there is a little temple on the on the shore. Uh, there's a, an area of occupation and so forth. And there's a, a lot a lot going on 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 Phylica, uh, during this time. And that that activity, uh, which has got a very strong Greek or Hellenistic flavour, including the the temple. Uh, uh, on, on the island looks very much to be a part of the Seleucid domination, so it's a political uh, element of, of, it's been suggested by, by some scholars that it's really a, an attempt by the Seleucids to exert some sort of control over the, over the northern gulf and, and it disappears more or less along with the, the, their, their power. So um, it's, uh, it's an interesting site, uh, a really remarkable site, a, a site with a very limited um, period of occupation and probably a very specific function, although that function is not entirely clear yet to us. Less well known and not very far away is the uh, one of the perhaps one of the most unusual archaeological sites in in the Gulf, Akaz Island, uh, which is now um, well. You can see it there on the bottom left. It's actually 
a the remains of a tell encircled by a roundabout in a customs zone uh, uh, warehouse area, really, on the not near to the port. You can see the red arrow showing it there. And Jacqueline Gachet uh, and her team dug this and uh, spent some time on that roundabout, surrounded by lorries and, and diggers and all sorts of stuff, um, and produced a really useful sequence, actually. It's a real pity, and it's an indication that the destruction, the indication that there probably was a larger and more um, a much more extensive archaeological site originally before the construction happened and it's just lucky that um, the team got in there to, to do the excavation before um, before well it's still there but uh, before nothing was was left and the sequence of, of occupation I more or less agree with with Jacqueline Gachet Bison Bison uh, she's changed the name since I, I once knew a long time ago um, I don't agree with Jacqueline's interpretation of the uh, the round uh, the, the the Tower of Silence on the top on the top levels level three and so forth above uh, which she dates to the fifth uh, century AD I don't agree with that I don't think it's a, a Tower of Silence and I don't agree with the, the chronology but I absolutely agree with her about level seven through um, to four uh, with the, the rate rough dating of second first uh, BC through to the second third AD a nice period of occupation a nice sequence of occupation at the site um, so it sort of it, it pops up not quite but pretty much at the same time that tel, uh, F5 on Phylica disappears um, whether there's a relation there or not, I can't say. What this site did, what this was about, why why uh, Akaz was there is not clear. I'm going to come on to broader interpretations at the bottom when I finish this, at the end of the lecture, and, and suggest some possible reasons why some of these sites were there. Again, going back to Dan Potts's work at the Eastern Province Survey, we have comments like the Hellenistic period, period presents an abundance of data. I think it's fair to say that I don't think Dan's understanding of the, or anybody's understanding of the chronology of the glazed wares at that time was as clear as it is now. But not, and so some of the sites he found might be a, a little bit later or a little bit earlier, probably a little bit later. But on the whole, I, th I think he's, he's, he's right. And I think this, this, this evidence holds up. We are seeing in this, in this, in the Eastern part, in the Eastern province, and we do see very marked increase in in activity and it's a lot of it this is important a lot of small sites it's not just the big sites like Taj and 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 Phylica, but it's a lot of these small rural sites that are popping up at this time and that's a really important point Faj I just mentioned which is currently now being um, uh, ex uh, investigated again by a CNRS team directed by uh, Jerome Roma doing excellent work I pinched some of the pictures out of his recent publication hope he doesn't mind if he's here um, and um, it's a fascinating and really exciting site uh, lots of questions. It poses lots of questions. Uh, just pops up, you know, relatively rapidly, and it's a huge 700 meter by 600 meter uh, rectangular enclosure built of limestone blocks, walls 4.5 meters thick, turrets every 40 meters, and the uh, and so this is well known with a massive uh, uh, field of burial cairns, 500 or more burial cairns scattered around the fringes of the site. I was lucky enough to go. Uh, this the photograph from Dan Potts's book showing the, uh, the remains of the wall that are visible on the surface. I was lucky enough to go and visit um, a few years ago and I'm absolutely blown away by the site and uh, I'm really jealous of Jerome being able to work there. It's a really interesting place. Um, he's been, do they've been doing geophysics and you can see uh, from the publication in PSAS on the left there, you can see that they're starting to get out a very, where it's preserved, a lovely town plan. So it's not quite as organized inside as one might, one might think, oh, that's a Greek or Roman town. Uh, but there's no Cardo Maximus. It's a little bit higgledy piggledy inside. But uh, nonetheless, you know, it, it's quite an impressive uh, site to have popped up in the, pretty much in the middle of the desert. Um, we know that the pot from the inscriptions it has Aetic uh, uh, Aramaic bilingual example here that they found recently, Semitic names similar to those found at Tarut and Bahrain, suggesting a Semitic population you, speaking a northwestern dialect. I think Michael um, McDonald's listening, so I have to be very careful what I say, but uh, a, a population with its own Semitic identity with a slightly different di dialect to that spoken further south. Uh, and to what degree they were in, there's a similar pottery. Um, assemblage, suggesting that there is some sort of cultural continuity across this region, uh, but who they were and what degree of uh, contact they had and so forth is not yet clear at all. Um, and this is the most famous tomb excavated at Taj, the uh, so-called, uh, I think it's a 14, 13 or 14 year old girl with a, a golden death mask who seems to have had a deformed hand, hence the little golden glove there. But um, and we can only wait, I think, for the excavation of further of those 500 mounds to find more exciting finds that are going to come out in the near future. So site that pops up, what was it doing there in the middle of the desert? We'll come back to that uh, further on. Uh, let's move into Bahrain. Uh, in Bahrain, uh, during this period, 
we have this maps a little bit out of well, quite a lot out of date now there are quite a few more sites than that um i don't want to go into the details but the broad pat pattern is very similar we see a lot of rural small rural settlements popping up and we see some quite large uh, cemeteries uh carlos al bahrain i've already spoken about briefly i'll say a little bit more about its existence in this period the um uh, similar, as I've said, similar inscriptions related, suggesting a relationship perhaps to, to the Thaj um, Tarut area, not surprisingly, um, with these uh, funeral stelae and so forth. This is Shakura Mound on the right there, quite an interesting pattern of graves. Uh, and the vast number of um, imported goods, particularly in this, the period that we're focusing on from the Mediterranean rather than from the later period where they start to focus a little bit more on Persia. Roman glasses are very common find. These were, I think, very well analysed and published by um, Sir and Fredson Anderson a few years ago in a, a very nice volume. And he does a great thing in, in, in dividing them into different periods, discussing the different types of finds that are buried, the great imported grave goods that are buried in different periods, and allows us really to look at um, the, the very crude numbers. It's not a very reliable statistic because there are things that we'd need to take into consideration, but the, it gives us a broad picture that there's a, in the early period, there's quite a good number of imported uh, uh, objects. And in that particularly that period, 50 to 150 AD, a, re a noticeable boom. And then, as I say, there's a, seems to be a trend away from Mediterranean imports towards Persia and uh, possibly a decline in the amount of burial. I suspect there was actually. Um, when it comes to, as I said, when it comes to Khalsa al-Bahrain, a, a site like that, it's more difficult to get a clear idea of how things are. You can't count the number of graves. You can't count the number of grave goods. Um, going through Monique uh, Kevron's uh, reports and summaries of the, of the trenches, we can see that most of the trenches dug at the site had some evidence of Tylos Hellenistique, as she calls it, suggesting that um, after that Iron Age lull, there was a, a reinvigorated uh, occupation of the site at, during this period. And I think that's that's reasonably reliable, though some may dispute it. I'm not going to talk about the fortress, uh, the, the dating of which is, is is debated. I don't think it's worth, we don't need, we don't need it as evidence here, so it doesn't matter. Uh, we can come, that can be as another. Uh, let's move to Edur, probably one of the best known um, sites in eastern arabia uh it was dug by a, an international team back in the 80s and then the the belgian team under ernie herring continued work there for a long time has a really unusual site on the coast of umal um massively wealthy on the one hand lots of these um cyst or kiss tombs uh some of them many of them with really uh amazing imported finds and local lo some local manufacture material um two forts from the later period one possibly from the earlier fantastic temple contemporary with the the main phase of occupation the main phase of occupation is from the first century ad through to the second ad relatively short although there is a continuity into the what michelle called the prd period or the second third uh, uh, uh third and maybe early fourth century at the site at two two forts one of the interesting things is the lack complete lack so far of of of, of domestic architecture um and one has to assume i suppose that the people who lived here because it's a very extensive site that the people who lived here were living largely in barasti or arish or date, date palm front huts um, or tents, and they were possibly semi-nomadic or, or you know, moved to the site seasonally, as is a, 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 it's a very common pattern in this part of the world. Um, and there's a, a marked contrast there between the domestic architecture and the funerary architecture, which is, which is one of the distinguishing features of the Dur. And sitting there on the coast in a, uh, behind a very beautiful mangrove uh, lagoon and island, the question really is, what uh, was this site doing here? Um, where did the wealth come from uh, to procure those amazing um, imported objects such as the Roman glass, Roman pottery and, uh, and other finds as well, such as uh, in the later periods of Indian material and so forth. Um, uh, it's uh, a bit of an enigma and one of the questions I'm going to try to address when, when I come towards the end of, of the lecture. Uh, that's, that's the early fort. I think now that there's just been some attempts to uh, reinvestigate that fort. It was excavated by an Iraqi mission back in the 70s, I think, and no clear idea of uh, of the date. It seems to be contemporary with that main phase of occupation. Um, it doesn't really look like it is, but it's uh, it looks a little bit later with those round towers. But we we and we don't know. So we don't so we don't really know very much about the organisation of the site socially and politically, um, militarily, and so forth. Uh, we can just see this possibly seasonal occupation by people living in tents and barastis, building these amazing tombs, importing this high quality uh, in, imported material, which is the, you know, the best, the best stuff that's going around in the Indian Ocean at this time, really. So something's good. Uh, something was going well for them. They had something to sell. I think that's pretty clear. 
some pictures of some of the uh, some of the tombs, some of the Roman glass. You've already seen a few few examples. It's ashlar or beach rock, actually. It, um, uh, yeah, uh, um, it, uh, Farouche, sorry, not Ashlar, this Farouche uh, or beach rock, uh, which is rather a rough limestone. There's nothing else available uh, in, this, in this particular location. Moving to Malaya, which is an inland site, about 60, 50 or 60 kilometers inland from Adur, in the, uh, currently in the uh, Emirate of Sharjah, uh, which has seen a lot of excavation and, and investigation. The French team who work there under, largely under Michel Mouton, um, uh, have uh, done, done a great job really in, in explaining to us the way the site developed over the four periods that Michel has defined. This is the site read just recently, it was about five years ago, the, the famous inscription uh, uh, talk, talk, referring to the King of Oman uh, was found. Um, but just to characterize the site, what we see, it seems, at the beginning from about the 3rd BC, late 3rd BC, is a very extensive uh, area of occupation, um, but no uh, substantial architecture. So again, similar perhaps to the, the way that Adur is looking, people living in tents, maybe or Arish, there are post holes and so forth. Let's have a look at the, so this is a, 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 brief, a brief summary of Michel, Michel Mouton's um, outline of the development of the site in the third to second Barassi occupation, looking perhaps he's thinking of a sedentarization of nomadic groups scattered around in, and we, we know quite a lot about how nomadic groups begin to sedentarize. Uh, we've seen, we can see current examples of it. They, they, there's a very distinctive uh, layout, uh, sort of in starting to develop a, 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 a nomadic uh, camp into a, into a, a, a permanent structure. We, goes on, we see a, a series of transformations going on. So um, we see the first mud brick a, a appearing in rather simple houses, and then those houses becoming increasingly complex with new rooms being added. And then by about the first AD, uh, we see the first pre-planned complex buildings and so forth. And then we come to PRD, we start to see a bit of a reduction in size and a focus on two large forts, possibly more actually, um, two that we know of so far. Um, so the size of the site uh, changes quite dramatically. It, 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 it declines. That doesn't for, for a period A, B, and C. That doesn't necessarily mean a decrease in population. I think that's hard to calculate. It's simply because the nature of occupation was changing, and the site was becoming a slightly denser and more comfortable with being a sedentary unit rather than a semi-nomadic unit. So the extent doesn't necessarily tell us about the population, but it does tell us about the changing nature of occupation at the site. And as I said, in PRD. Uh, the later phase, uh, more recent than Michel's work, this large fort was found beside the road. In fact, Sheikh uh, Sultan of Sharjah insisted the road be diverted. You can see it nicely on Google Earth and uh, massive mud brick fortification walls and so forth and, and, and uh, evidence of a local warlord or local bigwig um, who established his or herself possibly uh, in, in the region. So, and again, it, it suggests a very traumatic shift in the nature of occupation at the site and perhaps a complete shift in social structures and, and so forth. And there's another fort, which I'm not gonna mention today, which Michel dug himself more recently around the same day, a little bit smaller, that was destroyed about the um, beginning of the third century AD with some very nice finds in it. So the um, extensive uh, uh, cemetery of the site uh, along the southern parts of the, in, outlined in red there, and some really interesting um, uh, funerary architecture, including these, uh, well, um, you can see on the top right there, what the actual uh, tombs look like. They're built of, of mud brick with a plaster uh, rendering and these little crow step merlons, which are very typical uh, decoration of the region. And, and when, when uh, they were complete, uh, Michel, that's a reconstruction in that little inset there is a reconstruction of what they probably look like. And the parallels with uh, other uh, sites in the region, such as Petra, are obvious. And this has led Michel to, to talk about an Arabian tradition and again, an, an, an idea of a cultural, a sense of cultural belonging and a sense of shared concepts, such as funerary architecture, which covered, covered the region. Really interesting uh, 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 in perspective on what was going on. Um, but from these early, in these early graves, many, most of them, I think all of them actually have been robbed, but some of them contain Rhodian amphora and other imported goods from the Mediterranean. So again, even though this is a site which is some way from the coast and with no obvious um, resource, particular resource that one would imagine being sold into a, into a mercantile economy, um, we see they're importing Rhodium wine uh, from quite a way away, it must have been quite expensive, and there are other, other goods suggesting that there was they are engaged in a much bigger uh, economy somehow 
Uh, and to what degree that was the part of the growth of this site or to what degree it, it, it constrained or, or influenced the development of the site, we still not really, is not very clear to us, but it's a very interesting and I think an important element of what was going on at the site. Dibur, which is relatively, well, it's about 10 years now since, um, yes, 2014, this publication by um, Sabah al Jasim and Isa Yusuf, uh, and not so much known about the site uh, yet, uh, located on the other on the other shore, on the, in that little enclave which is shared by Oman and Sharjah and Fujairah a little bit, um, looking towards the Gulf of Oman and the and more towards the Indian Ocean, um, it would be really nice to have more information about this site. But the level three, uh, which uh, uh, Dr. Al Sabah and uh, and Issa publish in their in their PA, uh, AAE paper, um, uh, they date to the first second ad so roughly the same period as a door uh, the main phase of the door roman amphora there roman glass uh, it's we don't have the same level of preservation that we have in the tombs but there's a lot of material there suggesting again a, a very a strong engagement in the in the mer maritime mercantile economy that's going on uh, going past the site presumably and coming to the site uh, we've got glass uh, interesting analysis done on the glass that it's not the say it's not what one would expect in terms of Roman glass, but it's also probably not locally produced. So imported, but we don't know exactly where from. Possibly there were glass workshops going in on in the area, but we, it seems more likely to be coming from just outside the region. Material coming in from Northeast Arabia, Roman pottery coming in, Mesopotamian, Persian and Indian, uh, though I ask myself a little bit about the chronology, the stratigraphy of the site, because that Indian material for me is a little bit earlier than I would have expected. Uh, it might, it may be right, but it may be that there's a, 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 there might be a little bit of subtlety in the stratigraphy that was, was missed there. It's often very difficult. But anyway, this network of rooms, the, these adjacent rooms found in level three that you can see on the left there, interpreted as workshops and so forth with some local crafts going on, again, presents us with a picture that is, is really fascinating. What was going on here? And what were these people selling? Well, how were they engaging in this mar mar maritime mercantile network? What did they sell into it? And, and how did they afford the, the purchases, the things that they bought out of it? And that, I think, is one of the big, the big questions. If we want to understand what Dibba and related sites are, it's one of the big questions that we have to answer. So this is also, I mean, I think most of the people who know this will know very well that this is a period where we see uh, a big boom in 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 mon mon coinage. Whether I, I don't know if it's fair enough, or we, we can say and we're sure enough to say it's monetization, but certainly we see the widespread widespread distribution of these small, mostly they're bronzes, uh, coppers, but um, there are some silvers as well. They're I I imitations of Alexandrian tetradrams, as we know, uh, with a, a, a Semitic god and some um, uh, local manifestations on, and becoming increasingly sort of distant from their original uh, Alexandrian model as time goes by. Um, I'm not going to focus on the, the nature or the use of these coins. I think the fact that they exist and that they're found at all, most of the big sites, like Adur, Taj, they've been found, Leha suggests that, um, again, something was changing in the economy. I, I, well, these could have been used for, they could have been symbolic. They could have been used for paying armies. I, I don't know. But it seems to be quite a strong possibility that they were used to facilitate mercantile exchange in one way or another. Uh, and that's a possibility. It's far from certain. Uh, but the fact that they exist uh, for this relatively short period of time, uh, they disappear by the third, possibly earlier AD, um, uh, then um, that's uh, something to consider when we're looking at what's going on in Eastern Arabia, what was going on in Eastern Arabia during this, this long period. And there's a lot, I'm sure, from my own experience of peddling around here and there and sniffing out archaeological sites in all the places I've worked, I constantly come across small pieces of, of pottery that's likely to be dated to the PAR period more generally. This is, I'm showing this piece of uh, a news report here from about five years ago. It's from September 2015 at Saham on the Bartana. And this is, well, I just happened to come, chance across it. I'm sure stuff like this is going on all the time, but these are clearly um, Parthian or at least PAR, let's say PRAB, I guess, maybe C. Um, uh, material that was done unearthed by a farmer on the Bartina Plain, northern part of the Bartina Plain. And I guess there must be many more. Whether it looks like it was very likely from a tomb, but uh, you know, there would have been a settlement nearby and so forth. So a lot going on. So um, now that's I, nothing I've said so far, I think will perhaps apart from the newspaper article have surprised anybody at all. Most of this is pretty well known, but I just want to recap. What I want to add, I think that's a little bit new is to think a little bit about some of the 
smaller sites in the region. And um, I just want to bring up that more or less unpublished, but uh, Jürgen Schreiber did some work for the Qatari government some years ago at a place called Umammar. And um, here you can see that a wide uh, scatter of, of cairns, burial cairns, hundreds or thousands of tombs. I don't think he counted them accurately. And no a settlement attached to them in the northern part of the Oman, of the Qatar Peninsula. Um, Jürgen suggests a date of 1st BC to 1st AD, I think. Um, there, are, there are iron sword blades in the, in the tomb, so the, the nature of them suggests pre-Islamic, and the fact that there are iron swords in them suggests post-Iron Age in this region. Um, that's probably about as well as we can do at, at, reliably. But I think the general census is that, consensus is that they probably do date to the at least the 3rd BC to 3rd AD is probably reasonable. I was just speaking to, to Jose about this recently um, and may well date to the, to the PAR uh, C, uh, most likely perhaps to the C period. Now, what were they doing here if that's the right date? And we have to keep open in our minds that that might be wrong. What, were they, what did this, what, how can we explain this? We then no associated settlement. First question. Similar evidence exists elsewhere close by. Uh, for example, the work that Richard Cutler did. Um, uh, there are a number at Rasa Barak. Um, here you can see some, some evidence here. Uh, again, he's postulated a similar date. Very difficult to date these accurately. Even the human bone is often lacking um, enough uh, uh, collagen to, to, to allow an accurate C14 date. Now people are trying bone appetite dating and, and so forth, but we still, Need to go some way before we get an accurate date on these. On these, um, but if we interpolate the the work that's been done, so there were tens of thousands of these across the Qatar Peninsula. Something strange was happening, and they, they and many people who know the region have suggested that they they are also found in eastern the eastern province of Saudi Arabia in similar densities. And at the time I've spent there, which is very limited, I've seen numerous uh, cairns like this in big fields, but don't seem to have been explored or even recorded in some cases. And I think we are possibly looking at something quite remarkable in this region. We haven't really got fully got the, um, our heads around yet. Um, we moved to the Adias. Adias was a, a, the Abu Dhabi Islands Archaeological Survey is now sort of defunct um, organization that was set up and run by Peter Hellier and Jeffrey King some time ago in the mid 90s and did a great job at surveying the archaeological um, islands, the archaeological evidence on the islands of Abu Dhabi. And they came across a number of sites of various periods and Neolithic all the way through to late Islamic. But they did record quite a number of sites that we can allocate broadly to the PIR period. And they're scattered across that area, uh, circled by the uh, red oval there. There's a list of them. Some of those are listed by Helia. We don't know very much about these yet. Rob Carter himself. Oh, sorry. Um, yes, no, I'm gonna, I'll come back to that. I don't know what's happened there. I'll come back to those a little bit later. So they're there. Let's move on. Um, just uh, some work we did in, in, in Kuwait uh, a few years ago, the Kadhima survey, where we were looking principally at early Islamic settlement. But we, doing a broad um, survey across the desert on the region, on the edges of the Kuwait uh, a Kuwait Bay, where the red arrow indicates there, careful sort of transect survey. And we found quite a few sherds scattered here and there. That the desert is not empty, as everybody knows. Wherever you walk, there's remains of hearths and remains of old campsites and broken pottery. And we found quite a scatter of this, uh, these sherds, which I think we can link to the stuff that's found at Malaya and at Akaz Island from about, probably from the middle of the PIR period, roughly. I wouldn't want to be too more, much more precise than that. So again, a suggestion that um, underneath our noses, as it were, were uh, the, the Farges and the Malayas and, um, and the Phylakas are there, but underneath that level, there's, a, there's a, a quite a lot of activity going on uh, across the region, rurally, and even in terms of nomadic activity in some areas. And that's something we, we need to, to bear in mind. So there we are. That's the, the red splodge there suggests possibly the extent. We didn't define it perfectly. We, d we were able to show that it's there. So there's something going on we don't know about. I'm not, I just want to put this slide up. I don't know if Paul Yule's here today. Um, I'm sure he'll be cross with me if, if he is. But uh, the, I'm not going to say anything about the Samad culture. I'm leaving the Samad culture into a different zone. It's relevant, but uh, not absolutely relevant to what I'm trying to say. It's clearly important. So I'll leave that. So fine. So what I've done there very briefly um, is to just argue, really, I think that there's a very marked increase in activity from about the 3rd BC. That's quite clear. I don't think anybody would dispute that. And I've tried to argue that it's it's hard to explain uh, in many cases exactly what these sites were doing. We don't know. And that it's linked to um, levels of activity, rural and possibly nomadic seasonal activity across the region that we don't see very easily yet. 
but is there archaeologically if we want to look for it in detail, in enough detail. When we move into the third century, um, I've published on this, and I think this is reasonably well accepted now that there's a, a marked decline from about the third. Maybe Michel Mouton thinks that the stuff at Malaya was duffed up by the uh, Sasanians when, when Ardashir took power. I think it's a more, a more gradual decline that took place, reaching its nadir probably in about the time of the Kinder Interregnum, about the fifth century. Um, but there's a mark, I think there's a pretty clearly accepted now, a marked decline. It's, no, it's not that there's no activity. But across the region, there's a lot less activity than we've just been looking at. And these maps here are designed to set that out. And the coinage as well, the coinage is problematic in the, the function of it and so forth. But there's also a marked decline in the number of known coins, um, probably only uh, 20 or 30 coins known from the region. Uh, many of the Sasanian silvers actually come from early Islamic hordes, so they're not really can't really be counted. Um, the number of large sites that I wouldn't want to say urban really, but the big sites don't exist anymore, the Thages and Phylakas. Thage, I think Jerome's suggesting third to fourth. I think he's trying to push it as late as he can, fair enough. But I think by the fourth century, it's difficult to argue. And it was changing in the period coming up to that as well. Um, cemeteries, we don't know that many. There are some, and they're coming to light. They're more difficult. but So marked decline across the board in activity, presence. OK. So there's a picture, there's a, there's a story. Um, and now I want to think a little bit about how we might explain it. Um, that's the, so was there a boom? I think, yes, there was a boom, um, uh, in a, a very clear marked boom. Uh, that it, uh, that's coloring it rather crudely in maps, not terribly important. If we try to quantify it, and I don't think we can accurately, but it's worth just setting out that we, it, there are possibly two periods of activity. Um, we can make a distinction around about the zero AD first through on the basis of, for example, the uh, um, Phylica was abandoned and we see the foundation of a Dur or maybe Dibba and Akaz. So possibly something around that. And from there, that on from that time on, we see rather more sites, at least in this crude counting I'm doing here. That's not necessarily rub. Is Was there one boom or two? I think it's probably one boom that's changing in its nature uh, as time goes by. That would be my interpretation, but there's more to be learned about it. How do we explain the booms then? Um, difficult. We have to remember the first of all that this is a period when across the board, and this is from Tony Wilkinson's work, uh, showing numerous surveys, a uh, number of sites, counts on the left in those graphs. So it's not, it wouldn't be unique if we saw a peak in activity uh, compared to other parts of the, the Middle East, uh, including Mesopotamia and parts of the Lebanon and so forth there. Um, so that's an interesting point. It's not isolated, it wouldn't be an isolated boom. Secondly, we know that there's, uh, this is a period of quite intense, high volume economic trading activity, uh, often focused on Rome or in the minds of scholars focused on the Roman empire. But I think increasingly it's becoming obvious that the Parthian world and India uh, played a very important role in, in this. The, the, I'm thinking of these um, rouletted ware ne uh, trading networks going on in the, in the Bay of Bengal and all the stuff that, that used to be thought that it was the Romans that arrived and switched on the lights. I think it's increasingly clear that's not what happened, but it is clear that there was a lot of trade going on at this time, much more than there had been around the, this part of the Indian Ocean before and possibly less clear afterwards. So the boom might be broader than simply Eastern Arabia. I suspect it really was. When Ernie Herring, uh, God rest his soul, an old friend who is no longer with us, unfortunately, did, worked, did a lot of the work at uh, to Dur. Uh, he wrote a paper trying, yeah, coming up with, and really, is, you know, his suggestion was it was business trade that was going on. Well, yes, but that doesn't help us, I don't think, very much. Katrine's Rutan, Katrine Rutan's analysis of the ceramics, the Roman ceramics, in, shown in this map here, suggests very strongly that there were two routes to the um, southern Gulf, one down, through, as we know, but she can, she can sort of confirm it with the archaeological evidence, one through across the Syrian desert, down the, down the uh, Euphrates and Tigris Valley into the Gulf and through Jarak Svazinu and so forth, and, into, into the, and the other one down the Red Sea and around the other way. Fair enough. Um, but that doesn't, let's think about Edur that Ernie was trying to explain. Um, you know, that's a, gra a, a graph there from Katrine's work showing all the different sort of imported material. But it doesn't explain to it. There's a lot of trade going on in the Gulf. It's a period of economic ac activity. But why would people choose to stop at Edur? I mean, no one really goes to Umulguain now. So why would they have chosen to go to Edur then? Um, and that is a question that the 
simply labeling this as trade and economic you know, mercantile, merc mercantile activity doesn't answer. We have to go a bit further than that. So let's uh, think about the ways in which we might explain all of this activity. And, and, and the same problem is, is relevant to many of the other sites, not all of them. And I come up with these five possible things that I want to explore. Population increase, which would obviously be linked to agriculture, it would have to be, and probably then to climate. So look at that. Think about copper ore, which is obviously a, an element, uh, an issue when we come to the Oman Peninsula. Incense, obviously, could potentially important, though. Uh, we need to refocus perhaps the, the direction it was going in some to pearls, which is something, a, a topic that's been brought up by Rob Carter in his recent stud, uh, studies and so on, relatively recent, and maritime shipment and control and others. So I just run through those. I'm running out of time, so I'll move quickly. This is the, this is the map again of sites we're going to look at. Agriculture. I've already said, so in the Eastern Province area, lots of 65 sites, small rural sites. Uh, it doesn't necessarily indicate a change in um, if there's a pop, you know, if we get an increase in, in activity, because in that part of Eastern Saudi and Bahrain, the nature of um, aquifers, under, underground geological aquifers might have provided a refuge or a, a bit, a, a offered the opportunity to, to irrigate agricultural fields uh, using uh, Zagara wells, as you can see there. So it's possible that without any climate change or without any shift or increase or in precipitation, people may have been able to find ways in particular regions to increase agricultural activity. So it's possible. Um, but the sites that when we look at the sites, so we, the, the number of sites which we can we might be able to attribute to an agricultural increase in agricultural activity are very few. I mean, I don't think Adur or possibly Dibba, but certainly Malaya is one and, and Bahrain, the northern sites in Bahrain and the sites in eastern Arabia, in the eastern province are, the, are some which might just simply have um, in, you know, increase in population and increasing agricultural activity as the explanation. That map there on the right comes from a, a recent atlas of agricultural activity in, in Eastern Arabia, just to give you an idea how limited it is if you don't know the region. We look at um, Dominic Fleitman's work from, um, uh, from Hoti Cave or Hota Cave in Oman. Uh, not, it's the only reasonable, accurate, but it's not certainly not the, you know, that doesn't give us the, uh, this is not the answer to all of our climatic questions. But what we see, interestingly enough, when we look at the period is the, the red ones of the period, the red peaks there are periods of low precipitation and the lower white ones are higher precipitation. So this uh, Dominic's work would explain very nicely that the second part of our boom, the Edur onwards boom potentially, but it doesn't, uh, in fact, it, quite the opposite, doesn't explain the early, wouldn't explain the earlier part of the boom if it's absolutely right, because um, it, 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 so it's not if this is related to changing precipitation and climate, it's not a simple story. There's more going on than that. And we need to think about, you know, getting into the detail of the, of the periodization and looking at how things change. So Farge, uh, Malaya, uh, the Phylica uh, cannot be explained simply and cl climatically. Copper ore. Yeah, this is, and I know Lloyd's listening, and I was talking to him about this the other day, just to say, make sure I didn't say anything completely stupid, but it's always seemed to me one possibility, um, given the importance of copper, and that's, that map there shows the rough main concentration of, of copper ore on the, uh, in Oman. Um, it's one possibility is that copper was being smelted at source, which is the way it was done, and then ingots were carried up through Malaya, up the back of the, the foothills, and then out to Adur to go into the Gulf and maybe to Dibba, or maybe straight up the Bartana to Dibba. And it's a nice story. It makes a lot of sense. It would make a lot of sense. Um, it, it, but the, the, we haven't got any evidence to suggest that it was happening. Um, Lloyd points out quite correctly that when we look at the smelting sites in Oman, there are very few, there's very limited activity compared to certainly to the Bronze Age and later periods. There's very limited activity in this at this time. It may be that the sort of activity that people were doing didn't get dated. They didn't leave pottery behind, but I don't, it, it doesn't see. It's possible though that there was some limited copper trading and that would help us if it were the case that would help us to explain how the Malayans generated the wealth or the whatever they needed to ex to import those Rhodian amphora and all the other Hellenistic bits and pieces from the Mediterranean ditto at Dur a little bit later and at Dibba it would be nice if it were true uh, but if it is we need to find the evidence it's a bit of an archaeological dream at the moment I'm, I'm not completely convinced but I suspect there was a little bit of it going on at least um so these are the sites where we might imagine copper right? and put in Bahrain here because we can imagine it being a, perhaps it's not quite right, but we know there's no copper in Bahrain, but we do know during the Dillman period, for example, that uh, Bahrain acted as a sort of middle man on the on the copper route to Mesopotamia. So it's possible that it could have occupied a similar role uh, at, at this time. So these are the sites that might have some link to copper trade, though I, I'm not completely convinced myself, as I think I've, I've made clear. Pearls, 
Um, yeah, this is something that I think Rob Carter's work, his paper was about 10, 15 years ago now in Jezho, and then the book, Sea of Pearls, great work, really brilliant work, really useful. And um, he, he, it started through the Adias work, uh, those sites, those rural sites he found down there in that sort of armpit of, uh, between Qatar, Saudi and, and, and UAE. Um, a lot of tiny sites along the coast there, most of them late Islamic, led him to wonder what are these doing down here? And he argued, um, there's a slide coming up, to show this, he argued. There's, there, are, there are the maps there. He argued that um, these are related to pearling, and that they're transient nomadic populations who are possibly uh, sailing into the, the diving, but also wading for pearls in these pearl beds down there in that part of the Gulf. And it, the uh, part of the argument is that uh, the increase in sites that he was able to detect, particularly in a PIR period there on the uh, third. Uh, column from the left 330 and the late Islamic period they both coincide with historical increased historical mentionings of pearls so it's quite a not brilliantly strong but it's a pretty convincing argument we know that pearls were important um, and were being imported and were known for it from the Hellenistic period onwards and that nice lead, uh, which I pinched out of his publication the pearl divers lead weight there from a uh, suggests that there was diving going on so we need to consider it, per, the pearling industry more seriously in trying to understand and, uh, what's going on. This is a map from Rob's book uh, showing the finds of pearls around the region and so forth. And, and he emphasizes in his first chapter how, how significant this is. So the question, obvious question then is, could, that, could the pearling trade explain these, uh, it's particularly down in the Adia site and the um, Uman, the Qatari uh, tomb or cairn fields. Could that be uh, some sort of explanation? The way that the pearl industry might have worked, the pearling might have worked is that people, Bedouin nomadic groups might have moved into the region, uh, onto the coast during the, right, during the summer and engaged in, in wading or in proper pearling in, from boats. Uh, this is what happened up until very recently. And then when the uh, winter comes, people move away and, um, and go to work on their date palm groves and do other things. So it was part of a, 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 cy a, a cyclical pattern of activity that people followed. So it's quite possible that, and that would help us to explain why there are no settlements attached. Um, there's no evidence other than this uh, rather circumstantial evidence to support this argument, but I think uh, Rob certainly believes it for the Adias sites. And I think we, we need to consider it very carefully. And that, that in itself, the pearls in themselves would have bought um, wealth to the region that would have would help to explain and I think Adur itself um, it's a little bit to the north but then we know that uh, Jazeera Al Hamra, Julfar and, uh, and Sharjah and other towns were heavily involved in pearling further up the coast as a sort of stop off points so it's quite possible that the pearl trade has a lot to, to say to answer to explain the the existence of Adur I and mean, it's something that's been widely considered but I think um, we need to think about it now as a main the main reason for why Adur uh, is actually was actually there. So when we look at pearling, uh, we can explain some of the sites in the region. This is Lorimer's um, slightly clearer version of Lorimer's map of the pearl beds to give you an idea where they exist. And they do coincide very well. They don't necessarily explain our Kuwaiti sites. Uh, I can't explain those Kuwaiti sites. There were there was pearling in Kuwait, but it's not in the same location. So I don't think there were pearl boats that came down. So I don't think that works for there. Come to incense, then obviously Thaj, and this is a pretty, I think this is an easy one. I think everybody would have figured this anyway. Um, it's uh, very likely uh, that uh, Thaj was on a caravan route taking incense from the incense regions. I've just got one line on here, there may have been many others, up towards Mesopotamia. And now the only thing to add to here, the only thing I think it's important to say is that when te it tends to be that when we think about the incense trade, we tend to think about incense going into the Mediterranean and going into the Hellenistic and Roman worlds. And we need to remember that the Parthian world, particularly the big population center in Mesopotamia, had, as we know from the Babylonian era earlier, uh, had, there was a big demand for various types of incense in that region. So obviously Thaj is, would be explained to some degree why particularly where it is, but as a part of that, um, of that trade route. So there we are. That's a possible explanation for the for these. And and is it possible that Akaz itself represents a part of that trade network or that trade route? Possibly. Uh, again, there's no no evidence. It's a possibility. And the final thing to consider, I think, is this transshipment emporium not idea, uh, the sort of Ernie Herring idea, really, that we are looking at a series of of, of coastal sites. We are looking at a period where we know there's a lot of um, maritime trade going on. The only question is where did where would ships have stopped and why uh, over the short uh, voyage down the Gulf they're not going to need 
necessarily to stop for food and water. So there's going to have to be a reason why they stopped over to buy and trade and so forth. So um, it's possible that Phileka and Akaz acted in the same way that Suraf did in the early Islamic period, uh, where big sh ships were coming up the Indian Ocean and then uh, the goods needed to be transferred to shallower um, draft boats that so that, that could move into the relatively shallow waters of southern Mesopotamia. So it's possible there's something going on there. We, we, we've we figured that out. Um, Dibba may have been a sort of stopping off point where waiting for wind direction changes and so forth uh, and would have led, uh, uh, given access into that market in the interior of the uh, northern part of the Oman Peninsula. And Bahrain, uh, because of its relative density of population, uh, would have possibly uh, also acted as a center. So when we try to sort of nice colorful map here at the end, um, it suggests that this, this single boom that what I described is clearly, well, is most likely to be um, a series of different act levels of activity, different types of activity going on, all, uh, intermeshing as a complex network of different types of activity um, that give the impression of a, a, a big settlement boom, but there was agricultural activity. Perhaps I could incre increase that on this map. Um, there was, I think, almost certainly pearling activity in some parts. There may have been a little bit of copper. There may certainly was some incense in certain areas and some transshipment activity going on as well. So, um, so okay, that's just to sort of try to paint a new and look at, we need to go a lot further. And I'm not claiming uh, that this is the end at all. I just think that we need to start thinking a little bit more detail about how and what was going on and how it was going on in Eastern Arabia during this really, really remarkable uh, phenomenon. So a very, the, con the conclusions are really with a very clear boom in settlement and other activity during that period can be broken into two clear phases, I think. A period of, uh, of economic growth over a, a wide region is it's linked to, and the, um, there may be some uh, climatic improvement, increased precipitation in the, the later period, but it doesn't explain the whole thing. A multitude of activities going on, uh, the widespread ac economic activity across the MENA region or well, certainly encourage some of this economic activity. And we need to remember as well that feeding the Parthian Mesopotamian market as well as the Roman Mediterranean market uh, was an important element of, of the way that East, Eastern Arabia would have been thinking and oriented. That's the end of my lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs>